I'm Mike Tarr, and I'm um, actually in the psychology department, not computer science. I do have affiliations with both machine learning and robotics, though, and maybe that'll become clear in a little bit why. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you are computer science undergraduates? How many of you are computer science master's students? Anyone? Um, how many of you are engineers? And then do we have anyone else from Dietrich College or any other colleges? Mellon? One, two. Okay. Um, just trying to get a sense of who's interested in this topic. Now, of course, there's a lot of people who are watching it or doing it remotely. But um, so I study human vision. I've been interested in the process of how we take visual information and turn it into our interpretation of the world, how we really visually understand the world and then think about the world. So not like how the eye works, although we'll talk a little bit about that, but really how your brain takes information and turns it into something reasonable that you can think about. What you think of is intelligence. And so the connection between biological and intelligence and artificial intelligence should be pretty deep because both of them are solving similar kinds of problems. And a lot of what we think of as artificial intelligence, of course, is only useful if it interprets the world the same way we interpret the world. It doesn't do any good, for instance, if an autonomous vehicle drives in ways that are dangerous relative to the way we think it should drive. Or if some predictive algorithm on Amazon predicted things you don't really want. So a lot of artificial intelligence is really about what we think is reasonable. And so our interpretation of the world is critical. Understanding the visual system is really you know, one of the problems that's a hard problem, I would say. One of my favorite stories about vision being a hard problem is um, Back in the 60s, at MIT, the AI lab started. And the first AI memo from the AI lab ever um, was entitled the MIT Summer Vision Project. And it was one page long, and it basically said, we're going to write a computer program that's going to see the world and interpret the world uh, by the end of the summer. OK. Um, you can actually download it from my web page if you go. It's there. It's pretty funny. So they're still working on it. We're all still working on it. It's a hard problem. Um, and the connection between biological vision and computer vision, not only is there this task connection, but there may be algorithmic connections as well. And so that's really useful for all sorts of reasons. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think Bixhaw's got me scheduled to come talk at the end of the semester, too. We'll see what happens with that if I'm doing that. I always like to show this at the beginning whenever I talk about AI, um, because this is probably true for almost any kind of um, new technology or new theory or new idea. But this idea that something happens, people get really excited, you have this peak of inflated expectations. So now, of course, what, what is the current thing where people are all excited, the technology trigger? What was it? Sorry? Yeah, deep learning, right? So that's about 10 years old in terms of it really being practical. Um, so everyone got really, really excited. There's this peak of inflated expectations. People think, oh, we're going to solve all the problems. Um, then you get into this trial of disillusion. And this, is, this cycle repeats over and over again. Um, you realize it's a lot of limitations in whatever the technology is. And I think we're kind of in that with deep learning now. There's incredible expectations. It actually can do a lot of stuff, of course. A lot of problems that were not solvable before seem solvable. But now we're beginning to realize there's a lot of things that it can't do well. And we're beginning to rethink things a little. And then the, the slope of enlightenment is where you figure out what all those hard problems are and begin to solve them, and you get to this plateau of productivity. Now, I think you know, a company like Google would argue we're plenty into the plateau of productivity from the point of view of deep learning. But if you were to talk to Uber or Argo or Aurora, the autonomous vehicle companies, they would say, no, we're not in the plateau of productivity at all. The networks and the things that they use are really very limited, and they can't make cars really do what they want them to do on the road. Um, and we can talk more about why that's true. OK, so, oh, and by the way, please do stop me if you have questions. Even if it's a little off topic, it's OK if you're curious about something. Uh, let's see how we get that to go. There we go. OK, so one of the things I like to do is think about different models that are used in AI and what their purposes are for. Because there really are different things you can end up doing if you're studying artificial intelligence, um, depending on what your goals are. So one of the things you can do is, uh, why is it not advancing? There we go. So we can think about early AI. So from a point of view of early AI, so how many of you have heard of Herb Simon? 
So you're at Carnegie Mellon, you better look up Herb Simon. Okay, there's that building, the Simon Newell building. Um, Newell Simon building, sorry. Um, but he was a Nobel Prize winner. He was one of the early AI researchers. There was other people, a guy at MIT, um, someone at Stanford, the typical places. But these group of people started working on AI. Interestingly, it all came out of psychology. So in fact, Herb Simon was in the psychology department for most of his career at Carnegie Mellon. That's where he sat. Um, and early AI was really a bunch of psychologists that also had learned some computer science trying to build simulations of how our brains, act, well, not our brains, but our cognitive systems, our thoughts actually work. And sometimes people think of it as symbolic AI, classical AI, um, but it had a lot of cognitive plausibility. It was meant to be something that mapped well onto the kinds of reasoning we do. It wasn't very successful, that's why our performance number is so low here. Um, probably the most notable successes were in these kind of um, expert reasoning systems for like medical diagnosis. They'd actually just have a set of chained rules. So they could go down a tree search and they could figure out what your likely you know, disease might be just by knowing all the different facts about different symptoms and things in a way that a person couldn't necessarily do that. Um, but they weren't real successful as a whole, either in terms of performance, but also really in terms of actual cognitive plausibility. They did okay, but you know. Um, okay, so then that kind of went through um, a period where it was very popular, 60s and 70s. The 80s was what we might think of as the first AI winter. Um, AI had a really bad reputation. Um, it was not very useful. Computer science departments didn't see the point. Um, if you were someone getting a degree in AI in the 80s, it might be hard to find a job, believe it or not. Um, okay. And vision in particular was considered to be some, like, even the dark corner of AI, because reasoning systems may be useful, but vision as a whole didn't do anything. Um, so, okay, but then in the early 80s, this approach came around called parallel distributed processing, PDP, um, neural nets. Neural nets, of course, have been around since the 60s in one form, but in the 80s, there was a particular piece of technological triggering that made them more possible. What, does anyone know what that is? Still with us. It's pretty important. No guesses? Backprop. So it was in the 80s that backprop was figured out. There's all sorts of evidence that there were some people that knew about backprop earlier on, but it sort of became ubiquitous. Plus, computers got fast enough you could begin to do something more interesting. But so they had backprop all of a sudden, and um, so they had this way of training networks that they never had before. And a lot of that actually came out of, so I mentioned Simon, history of AI here. A lot of the PDP work came out of Carnegie Mellon. Most of you have heard of Jeff Hinton. Jeff was here as a professor, okay? And all of the early PDP summer schools took place in Pittsburgh. So there's some great pictures where Jan LeCun and Jeff Hinton and Michael Jordan, um, and I forget who else, a whole bunch of other really well-known people still today in AI are all just standing there, you know, they're all in their late 20s, early 30s, and over in, actually in front of this building right here. So there was a lot of things happening. And PDP was pretty exciting. It seemed to improve performance for some kinds of things a lot. So it's particularly pattern recognition tasks. You can learn patterns, you can do, use a lot more data, um, you could do speech, for instance, and it was a lot better relative to the symbolic systems in terms of certain kinds of what we might think of as more, um, biological tasks rather than cognitive tasks, seeing the world, hearing the world, and so on. Um, it also had this wonderfully interesting property that it was a neural net, right? The name itself implies it has some biological plausibility. It was a network of small, simple computational units interconnected with one another. And those interconnections and those weights between them that were defined in the network, that's what our brains look like. We have lots and lots of local computation units all interconnected together. So there was this kind of biological plausibility. But of course, the units they were using and the whole idea of backprop and things don't necessarily correspond directly to the brain. There's so a lot of criticism of PDP for being sort of biologically plausible, but not really. Um, and then it turned out that the performance had all sorts of nasty limitations in terms of what they could do or not do in terms of learning patterns well. They tended to overgeneralize. If you gave them too many parameters, they tended to um, um, not do a good, good job generalizing at all if you didn't give them enough parameter space. So they were basically learning a set of patterns from a one-to-one -one correspondence point of view rather than actually um, extracting anything from the input. Um, there was a lot of other debates, but if you're really curious, you can get these. There's these 
he said, she said kind of battles between the PDP people and the anti-PDP people. You can read there's large amounts of text written in which they attacked each other. Um, any of you heard of Gary Marcus? He's in the New York Times all the time attacking deep AI. He was one of the early attackers of PDP. He really didn't like it, and now he's decided he's going to attack deep networks just as much. So if you want to read a lot of attacks on this kind of thing, Gary's a good person to go read. Um, anyway, so PDP was popular in the 80s. It sort of went completely out of fashion by the mid-90s, except for the true believers. Um, there was people doing it still, like Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, but people pretty much were ignoring them, and particularly computer vision, which I study, and things... Not so much speech processing, but computer vision in particular. No one did PDP. They went to this geometric approach. Cameras got better. Computers got a lot more powerful. And there was a lot of work being done, but it was really more signal processing. And it wasn't really oriented towards pattern recognition or pattern learning in the same way we think of now. OK, and then um, we can think about things got a little bit better, partially, I suspect, because computers got better. People stopped worrying at all about biological plausibility. Forget about it being a neural network. Just use whatever you can for learning or, or representing information. They didn't worry much about the way that we thought about the world, cognitive plausibility. They just tried to make things that kind of worked. And so we got a lot of um, embedded pattern recognition systems or other reasoning systems that didn't worry much about humans, didn't worry much about brains, but did something. So one good example is there was a bunch of computer vision systems that enabled things like automated assembly lines. Or um, in chip manufacture, they developed a pattern system that would look at every chip and evaluate whether it was um, high quality or it had to be tossed in the bin. Uh, what's another example? There was other, I mean, other, but they were very constrained, narrow examples that didn't work in a general sense. But again, they were just trying to get things to work. They had better computers, they had some signal processing, they put it all together. Neural nets were never used in sort of production systems at all. They didn't work very well. In fact, there's a famous case. There's a guy named Mike Moser, some of you may have heard of. He's still around. He runs, I think he runs NeurIPS this year. Um, Mike built a house out in Colorado where he tried to use neural nets to control everything in the house, the thermostats. And, you know, it was like the first smart house ever, right? So now we think of that as a normal thing, buy your nest, whatever. He tried to do this with PDP, and the house was just awful. It turned the lights on at all the wrong times. It learned the wrong patterns. The heat was, it was either too hot or too cold. And eventually, had to turn off all the systems. And I guess his graduate students at one point hacked it, too, to like really make him life miserable. But, but you know, so the, it couldn't work. So even though there was this kind of neural nets that learned something, they'd never learned really the right kinds of things we'd expect. Whereas now, of course, most of you probably have something in your dorm room or wherever you live that's essentially running a uh, deep network to do either recognize your voice or to control the temperature or look at pic interpret pictures or whatever it is. So it's a normal thing. Um, I bought a fridge and a dishwasher recently, and it was impossible not to buy one that didn't have Wi-Fi connectivity and some kind of other stuff, which I turned off, but it's kind of weird. Like, you, now you can't but, but have it. OK, so then we get to the early 2000s, and sort of almost simultaneously, <coughs> Jeff Hinton and um, Jan LeCun come up with this idea of hierarchical neural networks, which we call deep AI or convolution neural nets. I mean, there's a couple little technological triggers. One of them was sort of a, a trick, the relus. The other one is what? What's the other technological trigger that made them possible? Computers didn't just get faster. What else happened? GPUs. GPUs came about. And suddenly you could do these kind of massive parallel computations that these networks really were built for in a way that before was very laborious and slow. If you ever tried to run a deep network on a normal, even a multi-threaded CPU, it's painful to train one. It's going to take a long, long time. So GPUs enabled things. So both, there's a great video actually of Jan with an early, um, I think it's the MNIST data set. With this re it's literally showing the, the results on an oscilloscope or something but in the 90s where he's got a hierarchical neural network before GPUs learning to do some pattern recognition. He's all thrilled that it's doing something. But both Jeff and um, Jan came up with this idea. What inspired them about deep networks? Where did the idea come from? Anyone know? Other than the neural network idea they've been around before. The idea of a hierarchical set of um, um, layers all passing information back and forth. The visual cortex also has a hierarchy. Right. 
So the visual, what he said was that the visual cortex, the primate visual cortex, monkeys, people, apes, has a hierarchical organization. You have inputs, you have bottlenecks, and you have a lot of connectivity going through a series of steps. There's debates about how many different stages there are. You know, it's probably on the order of 10. It might be a lot more, though, because it's hard to know where to draw the boundaries between neural connections as you move up. And both Jan and Jeff had studied the visual system. That was the main thing that they did. And Jeff, in particular, had done a lot of biological work. Jan had done some. And they were inspired to build a neural network that worked a lot more the way our brains are actually wired for seeing the world. And that was the other big thing. That plus the relus and the GPUs, and they took back prop and put it all back in there. And lo and behold, suddenly, things started to work. I mean, the most famous paper, the first paper, is the Andrew Ng cat paper. All of you know that, the YouTube cat videos. He was able to find all these cats by scouring through massive numbers of YouTube videos and actually learn something about the visual world in a way that we couldn't have done so before. And since then, obviously, they've become really, really successful. From a biological plausibility point of view, I've sort of put them a little bit in from PDP in the following sense. There's a bunch of assumptions they make, particularly the relus, but also um, weight sharing. If you think about it, weight sharing is something that our brains can't really do in the sense that our brains are only very locally connected. Neurons only connect to the neurons next to them with a couple exceptions, but there's a lot more local connectivities. And so weight sharing is something that's odd. So there's a bunch of things that happen in deep networks that don't happen in our brains, probably. That doesn't mean they can't be isomorphic at some computational level, but you have to think carefully about how things are implemented. On the other hand, performance went through the roof, right? Suddenly, all sorts of problems that couldn't be solved were solvable. One of the interesting things is all the AI people from the 90s who were the geometry vision people completely shifted. So the biggest conference for vision, CVPR, went from having like, I forget the years now, but went from having essentially a handful of deep network papers to I think within three years it was like 95% papers that did deep networks. And the reason why was because everything they tried for 20 years didn't work as well as the deep networks did. Whether it be some low level vision problem like segmentation or a high level vision problem like categorization. <coughs> so everyone had to shift. And all sorts of people, like the new dean of computer science, Marcel Hebert, he was one of the best geometry people in the world. He was known for all his work on visual geometry and how to use it, and he's doing all deep networks now. Can't win. Okay, it just works better. Okay, great. So, you know, where we want to be in the future, um, ideally, is we'd like to have better performance, right? That's the name of the game. Um, but you also would like to have some kind of cognitive plausibility, I think. And again, it gets back to that point I already made, that most of what we want to do in AI these days has to do with working with humans. So you better think more like a human in terms of the causal structure of the world, why things happen, how we socially reason, how we re react when we interpret the intentions of others. Um, there could be some version of an AI system that is just needs to do better than people, and it doesn't matter what people expect. And there are obviously ones like that, like, like fault detection bridges. It would be much better if it just found everything. It's not what people expect. But there's a lot of places where this kind of human computer interface is critical. Um, my, my favorite example of why it's so important is uh, Forbes and Craig. It's a busy intersection, particularly when classes are starting or ending. Uh, one of the Uber cars was at the intersection on Forbes, and it was right when everyone was streaming through back and forth. So the Uber car stopped at the red light. Light changes, but of course there's still, J there's still people crossing the street that were trying to beat the light. So it pauses, it doesn't go. People realize it's not moving, so everyone starts jaywalking in front of it. It sits through the light cycle. Eventually the light turns red, of course it sees it's red, it stops. People mass up on the corner, crossing, light changes, some stragglers, it freezes, people come behind it, it stays stuck. This happened for four light cycles. I wish I'd been videotaping, it was so awesome. Eventually you saw the person just kind of go and put their hands on the wheel and kind of inch up. Well, what's going on? Well, whenever you're crossing an intersection, a busy intersection in particular, and there's cars trying to get through and pedestrians like that, there's a lot of social negotiation. 
And there's a lot of interpretation of what the driver is going to do and what the walkers are going to do. Car didn't know any of that. So if we want to get to like future AI, we're going to need a car that can reason like the way we would reason when we drive, which is not plow through the intersection and hope everyone gets the hell out of your way. It's not wait there forever and hope they're really polite. It's some kind of weird thing where you make eye contact. Sometimes people stare you down so you go, OK, I'm not going. Other times they kind of make eye contact and you can go. You inch up a little. You let people know you're really intending to go. You know, but that's all stuff that's hard that we can't do right now. So, but hopefully we'll get to that point where things, you know, the one I always want is, uh, I mean, I know it's getting better quickly, but I still find all these voice systems like Siri and Alexa and um, Google Now incredibly stupid and frustrating probably 30 to 40% of the time. It's like, no, that's not what I wanted you to do. You know, and, you know, computer interfaces are like that still too. Um, and there's other things like that. So anyway, all right. Um, we really talked about this. I just wanted to make this point, okay, you can maximize performance. You can um, simulate things with another kind of AI. There are people that worry about AI purely as a way of simulating cognitive and neural processes. And they don't care how good the performance is, and they don't care how well it does for predicting human behavior per se. They really just want to make a better simulation. Not a lot of people like that left, but that does exist as a, an area. Um, and then this is what I'm talking about, this kind of idea. We want things to perform well, and we'd like to understand the way systems work at the biological or at the cognitive level. And at the end, I don't know if we'll get to it, but it may be another lecture. Um, there's some really good work by um, Dan Yamans and Jim DiCarlo on this idea that as we actually make better performing networks, they often also become better at explaining cognitive or biological processes. And it, uh, if I have time at the end, we'll talk about it. Otherwise, again, it might be a, at the end of the semester. OK. And then again, there's these AIs that are just supposed to predict human performance to sell you stuff. Actually, Jan LeCun said to me once, it's really annoying because Facebook will let me sell as many toothbrushes as I want to everyone. But I'm not allowed to use any of the stuff we do to try and actually help people. For instance, protect when people are depressed or that someone might be dangerous and violent because that all violates privacy. So there's this weird kind of thing where the kind of things that they can predict because of social norms can't actually do the things that would cause necessarily social good, but it can sell you a lot of toothbrushes. So, um, OK. Uh, you probably all know this, um, but it's important to think about deep networks use supervised learning, right? Lots and lots of data. That's the critical thing. And labeled data, okay? Um, one of the things to think about is your network is only as good as the labeling on your data. This is probably a problem for any of you that have worked on these networks. Without good labeled data, your performance will be crappy. Um, so, there's all sorts of features that may exist in, in data that would improve performance, but if they're not correctly labeled, you're not going to learn that feature to output mapping. So one of the challenges, of course, is trying to build systems, and they're beginning to do more of that, that we call them weakly supervised, typically, that there's some training data, but there's also a, you're trying to learn latent information within the data as well. Um, and people are really good at that. People don't just learn. If you think about a child learning language, Kids don't just learn the things that parents point out to them. Otherwise, we'd all be pretty pathetic speakers. Parents do do some of that. But kids learn a lot about the world around them just by play and exploration on their own. And so there's a kind of weak supervision because occasionally people are giving them feedback. They're getting feedback from themselves based on the consequences. Like if they hold up a plastic horse and they say apple, someone might give them a weird look even if they don't correct them. So there's this kind of subtle feedback that's happening all the time. But there's a lot of this kind of self-supervised active learning that happens. Um, so, but the basic point is um, deep networks tend to be very good at the kind of AI that predicts human performance when you have good labels and maximize performance, but it's not clear that it'll help us understand biological intelligence in the sense that people are able to learn in ways and infer things about the causal structure of the world that so far, it's not clear that deep networks can do. And it might require a different kind of architecture. And again, for any of you who have ever, I don't necessarily agree with him. I think he's a pain in a lot of ways. But Gary Marcus had an op-ed piece 
in this past Sun, not this past weekend, the weekend before is New York Times, which specifically said, which we all knew, so which is why I find it annoying, that deep networks aren't particularly good at causal reasoning or intentionality or some of these things that are important. Okay, so I want to give you some numbers, though. Let's get back to the visual system, because this kind of helps you think about what it is biological systems are doing. So we're going to start at the eye and think about the computations that are happening. And sometimes there's some fun reactions here. Let's see. So your retina, the human retina, has about 10 to the 8th photoreceptors on each eye. Okay? Packed in there on your retina. From your retina to your optic nerve, meaning the part of the wiring that goes from your eye back into your brain back here, you have 100 to 1 data compression. All right? So you only have about a million optic nerve fibers going into your brain. But your retina is 100 million receptors. And it's nonlinear. It's got a dense packing in the center where you tend to foveate or attend. And it's got a much looser packing around the periphery. And there's also differential kinds of receptors. Some are more sensitive to um, high contrast, very um, um, fast moving things. And other ones are sensitive to color and subtle low contrast information. OK. Now, in your retina, before we even get into your brain, you have um, four layers of computation. Any, did people know that? One person knew that. Um, your retina actually has four layers within it. You have two vertical layers passing information downwards towards your brain and two horizontal layers passing information across. And so that 100 to 1 data compression isn't just a kind of raw compression. There's a lot of computation going on within your retina to get you to that point where you only have a million samples. Okay, now to give you a sense of that kind of computation, there's a classical paper that's worth reading, it's not long, called What a Frog's Eye Tells a Frog's Brain by Jerry Levitin. He was an MIT professor. It basically demonstrates that in the frog's eye, in the frog retina, there are, is a computational network that allows the frog in the eye to detect moving black spots. But what's a moving black spot? What? Flies or bugs, right? What do frogs eat? Flies. The best thing for a frog, since these things are moving quick and it has to get its tongue out there, is to immediately signal that there's a bug out there and zap. If it's not a bug, not a really big deal. But you've got to catch the bugs or you starve. So the frog has wired up computations in the eye to do that. Now you say, well, but we're, we don't eat bugs. We don't have anything quite like that. Well, we're not so sure exactly what our retinas are doing in terms of that level of computation. But what I can tell you is that the ganglion cells, which is the layer before you go into your brain, the, first, the last layer in the eye before you go to the brain, retinal ganglion cells. I have a friend who's a, neuro, a retinal neuroanatomist. There are at least 20 different types of ganglion cells doing different types of computation in your eye. And we know what about like four of them do. OK. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening in your eye. We know there's a bottleneck. We know bottlenecks can be important for deep networks learning things, but there's a lot of other things happening that we don't understand yet. Um, it's really hard to study the eye. You can study the anatomy, but it's really hard to study the functionality of it because you kind of destroy the structure in trying to probe it. So there's a case where imaging techniques don't help us very much. So anyway, so that's just at the eye. Then you go into the eye. The optic nerve comes out, goes to the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN. And then you go from there, from the back of your brain up, in this area called V1, which is your first cortical layer. You can think about V1 as being a lot like what we might think about as the input layer in a deep network. Because the deep networks really are mimicking cortical structures mostly. V1 is kind of that cortical structure. And it's, there's this very clever naming V2, V3, V4. And then you go into this thing called inferior temporal cortex which is just a lot more layers moving along the brain. And there are these pictures. I think I've got a picture in here where people draw these analogies between a deep network and this hierarchy. OK. But the crazy thing is you have this 100 to 1 data reduction. From LGN to V1, there's a 400 to 1 data expansion. Things blow up again. You represent things now with more, a larger parameter space than what you started with at your eye. Some kind of computation going on again. We don't completely understand what. Um, OK. The number of samples keeps increasing, so you have at least 10 to the ninth neurons in these higher level inferior temporal regions of the brain. Again, locally connected mostly, although there are these other things 
called white matter fiber tracks, which you can think of as skip connections, for those of you that know that property in deep networks. You leapfrog a bunch of local neural connections and send information from one place to another. One of the cool things about white matter fiber tracks is if you want to talk about things that are genetically determined, that wiring diagram about how these long-range connections are arrayed in your brain seems to be driven completely by genes in development. They get put in place basically by birth. Learning doesn't affect their structure very much. So it's almost like your brain is a fairly uniform breadboard, your cortex. And then the way you build your actually functional circuit is by sticking a lot of these little patch cords to get information to flow from one place to another where you need it. And then you have lots of local computation just in the local connectivity. And that connectivity, that long-range connectivity, is what creates our functional architecture. Okay. Um, so we do have this feature hierarchy. Um, one of the things that's really different also between deep networks for the most part and um, the brain is we know that there's a lot of feedback. Okay. And that feedback, there's some evidence that it's almost two times as much information flow coming back from the top areas of your brain back into earlier areas than there is feed forward. I'll give you an example of one of my favorite feedback demonstrations. So there's these simple optical illusions where you can make one line look longer than another line, but the lines are actually the same length. Okay, have people seen these before? Usually in little kids, because they have the one with the little arrows sticking in or out, things like that. Um, if you look in the earliest parts of your visual system that you would think of as being mostly feed forward, just taking sen sensory, taking information and processing it, and people are staring at those that illusion, it turns out that the lines become actually represented by different amounts of neurons. They actually have different length representations in the early part of your visual system. But that can't be happening in the early part of your visual system. Something had to interpret them as being different lengths because of the illusion and then push it back down to the low levels of the visual system. So it's like, one of the things to remember is your perception is not vertical. Your perception is your interpretation of the world that keeps you from getting eaten and lets you survive. And if it creates an illusion all the time about the way the world works, but it makes you better at doing whatever task you have to do, that's fine. And probably, I mean, it's kind of philosophers occasionally publish papers that like to say this, that all perception is an illusion. And I think that there's a pretty tight correspondence between our perceptual experience and the way the physical world is, but it's, it can be broken pretty easily. There's a lot of places where we make assumptions or fill in or do other things that you're not aware of but allow you to function. I mean, my, fa my favorite other one on that is um, I mentioned the optic nerve. Because of the way your eye is wired up, the optic nerve goes through the retina and there's a hole in your retina. That means in your visual field, everyone's visual field right now, there's a gap where you can't see anything. Does anyone see that gap? No, right? You don't see the hole in the world. Why not? Your eyes are moving and you have this process called filling in. You infer what the world is like in that gap at any given moment. So you have no idea that there's a hole in your vision. It's there. And for instance, if something actually really dramatic happened right at that spot and you weren't moving your eyes, you would never see it. It was like it didn't happen to you. So you're constantly hallucinating a world and you're filling in all sorts of information and you don't realize it. And so the networks aren't inferential in that way. They don't have that kind of top-down thing. So it's one area where you know, we have a lot of work to do. And that's been really one of the really hard problems, by the way, is how do you take context and inference and meld it with the kind of AI we have these days? All right, um, the entire human brain, just to give you a sense of the parameter space maybe, is about 10 to the 11th neurons, and those neurons are locally connected by about 10 to the 15th synapses. There's typically maybe 10,000 connections per a given neuron, and that doesn't count these long-range connections, of which we don't even know what the total count is. So it's a big number. Um, all right, here's the problem from a biological point of view, and maybe from a deep network point of view. So that says on the board, it's a little hard to read, it says, then a miracle occurs. And of course, the scientists saying to the other one, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. So what's one of the big things that people have been working on in deep networks that people have been complaining about that we want to do? Right, explainable AI. Have you read anything that really explained AI? No. The people keep saying it is, but most of it's also kind of, it's lying by pictures because they'll show you some pictures and say this is what X does and you'll go, oh, I think I understand it because I can interpret the picture. It's not quantified, it's not explainable in any kind of algorithm way, it just, it looks good so you think you're happy. Okay, so deep networks are kind of funny, they're black boxes like this, that they do things really well but we don't complete, we may know why from an algorithmic point of view but we don't really know why from a representational point of view. 
And there also may be a mistake to try and understand them from a representational point of view because anytime we try and interpret what units do or collections of units do in some inter intermediate layer, we're imposing our own interpretation because we have some limited way of describing the world. And somehow whatever we can describe or verbalize or understand we think is the right answer. But maybe that's exactly wrong. Maybe whatever it is is just the thing that gets you to the task and our, interpret our standard of interpretation is irrelevant. Okay, well the brain is the same way. We have this input, we have this whole cortical network going up into higher level visual areas. For a zillion years people have been sticking electrodes into animals or doing MRI in people and trying to understand what's happening from the beginning of vision until we get to the point where we can out do output. And that's been a lot of what neuroscience and psychology has been about. Maybe that's the wrong question. In the same sense, within a deep network, it may be impossible to explain all the intermediate steps. It's just getting to the task. Maybe what our brains need to do is come up with representations that allow us, again, to function in the world successfully. And our standards of interpretation aren't the right standards of interpretation. Why should that be true? Okay. But this has been the big challenge. We really don't understand most of what's happening in the intermediate visual system. So often people make these pronouncements about, oh, in Scientific American or a popular press, you know, we understand all this stuff about the brain. Now it's really, really, you know, we're getting there. And it's like, eh, we're not. And maybe the question really should be, we should be building algorithmic representations that show you how you get from input to the right kind of task performance, like a deep network. But the intermediate steps may just be a set of principles of computation, whatever they are for an for actual neural network. And that's all we can do. So um, it makes science harder. <laughs> right, because you can't just intuit it and have an easy explanation, but maybe it's the right thing. Um, so one of the things I like to do, think about, though, is the way vision works, is if you're trying to fill in this set of stages, again, we can't necessarily say what the representations or exact computations are, but we, I, can't, I think we can break vision up, and probably most sensory systems, probably hearing is the same way, smells a little weird. If you ever want to talk about smell, smells really weird, smell and taste, but hearing and vision for sure, um, you have these early kind of filtering algorithms that seem to exist. So many of you are probably familiar with center surround organization, or, or um, sometimes it's called a difference of Gaussian. And, that, and those are these edge detectors. And even within deep networks, essentially, it implements or learns edge detectors in the early input stages. Okay. Um, it's really pretty much a filtering algorithm. It enhances contrasted boundaries. It makes things that, where there was a difference in the image more salient. Okay. And if you go into your Python, into what is it? C, what's the vision package for Python? CV? Yeah. There's a canny edge detector and a bunch of other edge detectors. They implement something like that. Okay. Then you have this mid level vision. And I think of mid level vision as being you do a lot of unsupervised learning. There's a lot of underlying structure to the inputs that you get. And you can do that in an unsupervised way, right? Things cluster together in reasonable ways. It might be somewhat noisy, but you can learn about the structure of the input, and you can essentially do data reduction. OK. And then from there, and then so you know, it might be you're taking multiple information channels, you're doing Q combination, whatever it is. You're just doing a bunch of things. But then you have this high-level cortical type of system, or in a deep network, the learning system, where it's supervised. You're getting labels. You're getting some kind of output measure in terms of the task. So again, tasks for the deep network are often just getting the correct labels. For a human being, it might just be correct task performance. So you know, there might be five times I'm trying to pick up my phone if I'm not doing it correctly because I'm a little kid trying to learn coordination. But eventually, I do it correctly. That's good labeling that I did the task correctly. Supervised learning. And I think you end up with coherent objects events from scenes in the end. So I actually think most sensory systems, whether it be an artificial system or a human being, work in that kind of in that way. And then there's this feedback, this interaction between the systems. OK, now I'm going to do a little bit of history here, just because it's kind of interesting. But then it'll, it sort of goes against what I was just telling you. So there's this idea, again, that we, were, we should be able to understand and interpret all the underlying representations in the intermediate stages getting the task performance. So again, in AI, that's been these explainable networks. In, in neuroscience, this is mostly doing neurophysiology and sticking electrodes mostly into monkey brains, but sometimes into cat brains, and showing the animal different pictures, sometimes doing a task, sometimes not, and seeing what pictures drove a given neuron the most. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because you're going to see a lot of data like this if you ever looked at neuroscience. And you should think about how to interpret in the context of modern AI. Uh, 
So one fellow named Keiji Tanaka did a lot of work on this. Um, and he would take a neuron in the monkey inferior temporal cortex, and he would show it a whole bunch of different pictures, little patterns, like these ones on the left of the arrows. And he'd find a neuron. Let's say the neuron really liked that spiky thing. It seemed of all the things he was showing, it, it liked that spiky thing the best. Then what he would do is he sort of had, it wasn't really algorithmic directly. He just kind of had a hand data reduction form where he kept reducing the amount of image information in the spiky thing until he got down to the minimal picture that would still drive the neuron the same amount. And what you see here from the left to right mapping is what he found for each of these cases. But there's a couple things about this. Does anyone think about some problems with this? OK, how much of image space did he explore in showing these little patterns to the monkey brain? Not much, right? He had, like, I don't know, it was a couple hundred patterns that he could show the animal. I mean, you can only record from a neuron usually for an hour or two, and then it usually dies. OK, so he's guessing about what he thinks the important stuff in the world is. So it could be he's in some local minima or some part of the space of what drives neurons, and he's not even close. Plus, he assumed they were all coherent objects. Maybe that's wrong, right? Again, maybe the patterns, but that's what he did. And then he found that there were these more minimal patterns, but even his data reduction technique was really very ad hoc. OK, I'm going to reduce it down to higher contrast, simpler things, and I found, yeah, this still maintains it, but maybe there's something else that's better all along. OK, so that's a typical physiology experiment. So when you hear, how many of you heard this phrase that there's neurons for face recognition? That's a classic one. Or there's an um, area of the brain just for face recognition or scene recognition. OK, that's all based on these kinds of techniques. It's not very nuanced. And it sort of throws computation under the bus. It says, we're going to explain something in a reified way, meaning we're going to describe something by the thing we found that it does, rather than really explain it. So it'd be like saying, oh, I built a steep network to do speech recognition. Well, how does it do it? Well, it does speech recognition. It's a speech recognition network. What else do you need to know? That's like saying, oh, there's a face neuron in the brain. Well, how does it do it? Well, it's a face neuron. It processes faces, right? But there's a lot of that kind of logic, and you'll hear it all the time. So you have to be really careful to say, wait a moment. That's not an explanation. That's a redescription of the task. And it might not even be the right description of the task. Do people understand that point? It's a pretty important point. Okay. And so the same is true for explaining deep networks, which is always kind of saying people show a picture and they'll say, well, this unit does X because it looks like a husky dog or something. Well, we don't even know that's the right thing that really is its best image. It's, you know, um, and what does that mean? Like, why is it doing husky dog processing? You know, like, how does it get there? So anyway, so this is um, work that was done. Um, and just to show you the complexity of this, if you get a little more subtle about it, this is more recent work where actually a friend of mine, Dave Scheinberg, um, did, he was showing the monkey thousands of pictures. And he was recording from lots and lots of neurons simultaneously. And for each neuron, what he would do is he would rank the pictures it liked the best. OK, so those black lines are neural responses to the picture on the left in each case. So that top neuron there liked, each row is a neuron. I don't know what that thing is. It's like. I think it's a pair of earrings, little heart-shaped earrings. OK, and then it liked a pine cone next best, which is the second one. And then it liked some other weird thing. And then a wheelchair is rank five. So those are its top five rankings. All of those objects on the left, the black lines, were familiar. The monkey had seen them before. The green lines are, and those green boxed objects are objects that were seen by the monkey for the first time. They were completely unfamiliar. So for each neuron, he's ranking the object that we liked for its top five that were the most familiar, that were familiar, and then the top five for unfamiliar objects. And what you can see is familiarity makes some difference, but not always that much. And if you were to try to come up with a coherent description of what each of these neurons do, good luck to you, right? I mean, you go, maybe you go to the first one, you go, well, it's kind of a pine cone neuron. I don't know. Um, but then there's one down there that seems to like cups and pine cones. And like trying to extract what visual features are critical here. Who knows? All right, so it's a much harder problem. But if you did what Tanaka did in the previous one, you could deceive yourself using these same kind of stimuli into thinking you'd found the answers. 
So I was actually, some of you might know Deva Ramanan. He's a um, vision researcher here. And Deva's lab group has been spending a lot of time trying to do explainable AI. And I said, you're all turning into neuroscientists, whether you realize it or not. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to do was talk, yeah, well, I already talked about this visualization being a bad metric. OK, so these are examples of, I think this is a paper that came out of Google where they were trying to show for different layers of the network what the network was doing. And they kept trying to put interpretations on these different patterns. Um, and particularly, they got up here, and they'd say, objects. And they could sort of see some objecty kind of things in here, like eyes there. Oh, this is an eye unit. OK. Um, but even the visualization process to get there is really um, kind of sketchy. But I also want to talk about another one that I find a little bit, if you're a consumer of AI and biological vision, all this stuff, that you've got to be careful about. Okay, this is this hierarchical correspondence idea. So this is what I mentioned before. People love to show this map of the brain. So here we go to the V1 there. The purple is the back of your brain. And then this is your hierarchy of processing going forward into more and more complex layers. And then they'll build a thing that looks a lot like a um, deep network, but this is just a map of the number of units in the visual system. So that's just some correspondence to the um, relative number of units in each of these different layers. So you can see, if you go from retinal ganglion cells to the LGN, there's about um, an equal number of layers, uh, equal number of units. And then you have this 400 to 1 expansion happening over in V1 and V2. You get a lot more units. V4, you have less. And then you have this kind of recurrent networks and things like that. Here, you've got a very simple deep network idea that they were showing. Um, this is an earlier one. But the idea that there's this hierarchical neural network. And people love to do this kind of correspondence drawing. You will see it in many, many papers, both in deep networks and in biological vision these days. And it's really deceiving because, yes, there are these rough correspondences, this kind of processing happening. But there's so many other subtle different things happening. It's, again, you can easily fool yourself by the illusion of the correspondence. Right. Like, uh, uh, and not only correlation in the sense that, OK, they are both edge detectors. Or right. Something. They have the first layer, the features from the first layer of the CNN actually predict. That's the, the Yamans and DiCarlo paper. Uh, yeah, the, uh, actually predict the neuronal activations. In the right. Neuron. So that, that was exactly the next point. That's good. So there's this idea, for those of you who didn't necessarily hear it, there's been a couple of groups. It's actually become quite popular to show that you can take the representation of information in different layers of the network and the representation of different layers in the brain and show that there's a correlation, which may not be that interesting because if you think about it, you're starting with the same inputs and you're getting to somewhat the same outputs. So there damn well better be some correlation be the way information hierarchy gets processed. But the better one is what you alluded to is that there's also been predictive work where Yamans and DiCarlo took the pooled set of units from um, one of the layers I forget which layer it was. It wasn't actually the early input layer. So it was a little V1, further along. V1, V2, V3. It doesn't work for V1 actually so well. The predictive stuff only works for higher layer layers. Um, I think the IT, IT works well, right. So they take the pooled units from the layers within the network, and they use those as a potential population of units to explain the variance in the neural data for individual neurons responding. And they can find that when they do that, that the network was able to predict the variance in the neurons responding. And beyond that, um, it um, not only can explain the variance, but it also, um, what was I going to say about it? It, it um, oh, forget, I'll forget the point. It's pretty subtle. But, uh, but basically, that, that there's some way of predicting the neural responses for individual neurons. Um, the issue with that is not that it's bad, but that we don't know that that particular predictive ability, what the benchmark is or what the ceiling would be. So it's better than zero. It's, not, it's significant. But it could be that there's some other model that could do a much better job. And so to assume that, therefore, the network is the same architecture as the brain would be a kind of leap of faith. Again, because they solve the same kinds of tasks. And so they would, should have some correspondence. But it is very interesting. Um, but I guess my main point of this would be you've got to be careful about how you think about this correspondence. And most of the papers, except for that one particular paper, have been purely correlational. 
And I don't think the correlation is impressive at all. Again, because we don't have a baseline for what's considered a good correlation or a bad correlation. Um, the, no, I'm not going to get into it right now. There's something, there's this, there's this other more recent set of papers that are really interesting, but it's a divergence, so we'll wait on that. Okay. Um, but to, get, to follow up on this point about the idea that um, there is some correspondence, Yamins and DiCarlo made the following argument. How are we doing here in time? We're good. Um, they said, okay, look, there's a hierarchical correspondence between the representations in the network and in the brain. We see that correlationally, but also predictively. So here's what we really want to know. Is there a better network that could do a better job explaining the data somewhere out there? That would be more like benchmarking things. So they did the following. Um, they argued that task performance could be a good measure for actually explaining brain data. And the reason why is, presumably, if you're doing the categorization task better and better, you're corresponding more and more to what the brain actually is really doing. Because the categorization task, as I mentioned earlier, is defined by the labels that humans put on the data in the first place. So it should be like what the brain's doing. Everyone with me on that part? So they built, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, OK. What they did, they um, picked a task that categorized object categorization. And they optimized the network parameters for performance on that. OK. Um, then, what the, well, okay. What, then what they did was they fixed the network parameters, and they compared the network to the neural data. OK. Um, and the argument is, is that this is a reasonable thing to do, partially because of the fact that um, if you don't fix your network parameters and you try and fix your, and you try and adjust your network just to explain the neural data, you're going to have a massive number of network parameters, and you're probably never going to explore the entire space well. It's almost impossible to do. You're going to be hand tuning forever. Um, but if you just what you do is you just um, collect millions of images and you train the network at that point, it's a lot easier also than collecting a lot of neural data to try and have your network fit it. I'm not explaining that that well, but okay. Um, I'm going to skip that. Okay, here's the, here's the picture I wanted. Good. All right, so here's what they do, though. Once they've got this network and they've got the architecture working reasonably well, they had three different kinds of networks they created. Um, on the x-axis down here, they have the performance of the network, how well the network is doing. On the y-axis here in the left picture, what they have is they have how much of the neural data it's explaining. Everyone with me on that? So how well is it doing for explaining the brain data? OK, so you could have a point down here that's really good at doing the task, but really crappy at explaining brain data. And you could have another model that's up on the left-hand corner that's really good at explaining brain data, but crappy as a task. What you see is that there's a reasonable correspondence. But here's the really, really cool part. Um, they did three kinds of things. One is they tried to optimize and now change the model parameters to try and um, explain as much of the um, brain data as possible. Okay, And those are those red dots. And they um, do pretty well at explaining the brain data, but they never get very good performance. They get mediocre performance. See, so the best red dot over there for explaining the brain data never really gets nearly as good as the best performing models you could possibly have. OK, the green data is just random selection for all the parameters. And you kind of get a space of things where you sometimes do better or worse. It's just a baseline. The blue data is the really meat of this. So what they do here is they use a um, other supervising network to change model parameters to try and optimize the performance of the network. So that's all that's happening in this blue data is they're trying to change the network to perform better and better. This is really computationally expensive. For any of you who have played with deep networks directly, you, to have another network on top of it optimizing the performance of value and then changing model parameters in that space and iterating through. I forget how much computation they used, but it was scary. Okay. Um, but they did that, and what you can see is, on average, as you get better and better performing networks, you also do better and better at explaining the brain data. Now, that's pretty cool, right? That goes beyond just saying, oh, yeah, we can use the network to explain brain data, but that something about the performance of the network directly relates to how well it happens. So now you've got a benchmark rather than just a raw correlation. OK. Then what they did was they took their best performing network from this general thing, and then they, and this is just the tip of that data, 
but they took their best performing network, and then they moved from that, and they optimized even more. I forget how they did the optimization even further, and those red dots are as you continue to optimize. And what you ultimately end up with is a very, very high performing network that's performing, notice the y-axis changed here in terms of its values. It's the same um, dimension, brain data explained, but you're up more to 50% of the variance explained. So the more they pushed to optimize the network, the better they were at explaining the brain data. Pretty cool. So there is something deeper going on there. We don't completely know what. Again, it may not be explainable, but it's pretty compelling that the two things are intimately linked. Now, I mean, one, oops, I'm going to go back. One question I'm, you could ask yourself is, if we really understood the brain data, notice we're only explaining 50% of the neural variance. Maybe we could then push back into AI and have an even better performing AI network. And there's actually stuff in my lab right now where we're trying to do that. We have a large scale MRI data set of people looking at pictures, and we've been using it as a regularization um, data set for trying to train vision networks, not under normal conditions, but under what we consider few shot conditions. For those of you who know about few shot, where you're learning from a small number of examples. And the idea is latent in all the brain data, there's a lot of information that could explain and help a network learn about categories that otherwise might be difficult. I actually think vision is the wrong problem to do this on because the really hard problems, like vision is still pretty constrained and clear and labels correspond pretty nicely. The right problems to do on are things like human theory of mind, human intent, human emotion, affect, social interactions. Those are things where bidding, getting labeled data is really hard and it's not even clear how you label the data all the time. But you have all this data in your brain, if you were to collect brain data on how people respond to emotions. In fact, you can think about emotions as being only defined by your brain responses. That's all there is, right? There isn't any, there's no, there's no, thing, there's no truth or validation to emotions in the world. They're purely a brain state. Pain is like that too, okay? Um, those may be cases where the brain data could dramatically help an AI system learn a lot better about those states because they're really hard to do, do from a learning data um, labeled kind of way. Um, any questions about this? Okay, so just this is point is to show that there's this deeper connection probably between the two systems. I'm gonna skip this. This is actually the point that you already made pretty much. You can also predict individual neural data quite cleanly. So again, the network, once you've got the best performing network, you can take pooled units from one of the layers and you can predict the neural data very nicely for individual neurons, which is really impressive. All right, there's these kinds of graphs too, which you'll see sometimes. These are a little sketchier. Um, these are called representational similarity um, or representational dissimilarity, depending on which way you like to flip it. Essentially what you do is you take all of your inputs, you array them on the x-axis and you array them on the y-axis and you measure the similarity between all of your inputs. So between input A and input B, you get a similarity metric. Between input A and input C, you get a similarity metric. And you show that as a color-coded um, matrix. You can do that for your brain. You can do that for a deep network because it has a similarity representation. Your brain has a similarity representation. And you can compare and then correlate your matrices for those different things. The problem is, again, we don't know how to evaluate what's a really good level of correspondence. I mean, if you had 100%, it'd be great, but you're never near 100%. So yeah, the networks do, population do pretty well. I think that the best performing similarity levels they got were into the point eight something in terms of a correlation, but maybe that's by definition going to be doable because the inputs are the same and the outputs are the same. Again, I don't think that defines something as being a good model or not. Um, and again, you'll see a lot of these. This is human fMRI showing the same kind of idea that you can show some similarity between the representations of all your inputs. This on the left is a human brain. This on the right is a um, um, deep network, neural network. So. Um, yeah, that was just a point. All right, I want to go to one more thing here. Okay, I want to make a couple more points. Any questions right now? Nothing? So, uh, when we say that we are comparing neural networks, just we forward networks to the things, uh, neurons in our brain, how do we... Uh, State when, uh, because there are some biases that the brain that we are born with, right? Right. Right. Because I read about an experiment where babies who have never seen faces before still react more to faces than they right. 
So that's actually that's one of the big. So one of the big, my lab actually the thing that we've probably been working on the most is the question of what are the minimal assumptions we need in a visual simulation of or in a deep network to get the kind of performance and structure that you see in humans. So for instance, why is it the baby's oriented to faces at birth? Like what is the minimal assumption we need to, to get a network to learn about faces? Is there something about the structure of faces as input so it just happens naturally? Or is it something where we need to build in an assumption about the structure of a face? And more generally, like whole hierarchy that we have in our brains for organizing information, how much do we need to impose structure on a network versus learn it directly? So one of the things we've been doing in the lab is we have a very detailed retinal simulator. It simulates all four layers. It, it takes inputs, and then it produces dynamic outputs, a lot like a real retina would. I didn't build it. We got it from a group in France that does retinas for a living. Um, we've been trying to interface that to a convolution neural network to understand how imposing the constraints from a retina changes the architecture of the network as it learns. Um, it turns out to be a lot harder than we thought, not surprisingly. But one of the ideas is ultimately is that independent of any structured inputs, just putting noise onto the retina, you may be able to get the system to develop a kind of local architecture that's a lot more like what the brain has. Because the retina imposes a set of structures directly because of the way it's organized that it then can propagate up the network. Now we realize that, for instance, fully connected networks aren't connected are kind of the wrong thing to do that way, so we've had to go to locally connected networks. There's a dynamics to it. There's all sorts of other problems that come into it. But those are the kind of ideas we've been asking is what are the minimal cases we need to do things? And there's other ones like that. Um, it's a really interesting question. It's a case where deep networks can be really useful because you can say, you know, you, there's also things you can't do with a baby. You can't deprive it of a particular kind of input or give it really weird kinds of inputs and then see how it learns. But we can do those experiments in a convolution neural network and see what are the cases that lead to reasonable structure versus where you get into syncretic things. I mean, one thing actually we discovered recently, and it turned out people knew this, but it hasn't been well publicized, is training with noise actually improves performance. So some of you may know that. But that's kind of weird if you're using real noise, and yet it still seems to improve performance in deep networks. And we had this problem. We were using noise as our baseline for some things, assuming that, well, you had to have structured inputs. And then the question is, what was the minimal assumption? But it might be that you can imagine, if that's true, that in utero, the baby's neural network, its brain, can be trained just by random noise firing on the retina. And it could still lead to better performance when it's born. So then that's the kind of assumption you might want to say, well, maybe that's just the way the things are wired. And that's actually useful. So it's kind of cool. Um, OK. so. I wanted to just talk about some of the constraints and some of the other issues. So one of the things that's an important difference between typical deep networks, although it's becoming less of a, um, I guess, of a, less of a stereotype of a deep network, is that networks learn from millions of labeled examples, typically. People learn from very small numbers of examples. Kids see, and there's a period where kids are quite young where they see a new object and they learn the category names for hundreds of objects in a day. They see an object once, they understand it's a new category, and they just move on. All right? um, within the deep network literature, that's often called a few-shot learning approach or a one-shot learning approach. Those actually work a lot better than they used to. So I'm not sure this is such a caveat as it used to be. But it's certainly something we'd like to make in our general architecture. It shouldn't be that we have to depend on millions of labeled examples for all of our training. There should be some way in which, given a set of pre-existing conditions, whatever assumptions we need to make, plus um, a mechanism from learning from small numbers of examples, we can bootstrap up quite quickly and have robust learning. OK. The other thing that's often brought, some of you have probably have heard the name Josh Tannenbaum. Josh has been a big proponent of this, arguing um, that people learn richer representations that are decomposable into parts, and then recomposable into new things. You can generate new examples. You can parse an object into parts and relations. And you can understand new instances for the class. All these things are, you know, so how many of you saw the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile out in front of the CUC a couple weeks ago? You know, OK, it was this big car that looks like a hot dog in a bun. Well, that's, a gen that's an example of like sort of, you don't completely misunderstand it. You understand it's somehow a vehicle, and yet it's a representation of a hot dog in a bun, and there's all these other, so there's this way even that's compositional. And like that's the kind of thing that might throw a deep network off and never seen anything like it at all, wouldn't get it as a car. Um, 
And so Josh's argument, and a lot of other people have said that, well, that's something humans do all the time. We're compositional, we can generalize. And so one of the big challenges for networks has been how to do that. And it's not clear that yet that most modern AI systems really have that level of generalization and compositionality. Now, there may be ways to do that. There's actually a project I have jointly with Marcel Haber, with a robotics student, where we've been looking at a kind of representation that may allow generalization much more broadly and actually a kind of compositionality. And one of the things I think that's thrown people off is people tend to think about, and this gets back to my point about understanding brains or deep networks. People think about compositionality as being breaking an object or thing up into parts that we understand, right? So if you're talking about a human body, it'd be, oh, arms, legs, head, torso. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe really compositionality and generalization involves parts that a network can understand to do its job well in terms of performing the task, and it can recombine different kinds of representations to generalize to a new thing, but they don't have to look like the kinds of things we understand as parts. And so maybe redefining what we mean by compositional to just be that units can be recombined in functionally relevant ways to, to enable better task performance for some new inputs is really the thing we want to do. But people have tended to veer into saying they have to be interpretable parts to humans. And that's probably a bad idea for all sorts of reasons. So there's more to say on that. But that's an area of very strong interest right now. But there's, it's far from solved. Um, let's see. Uh, OK, right. And so I was pointing out that these really may not be big issues in the, um, in the future or even now. Um, one of the things I also it's probably worth mentioning. So you all heard of GANs at this point. And so that certainly they're also generative in interesting ways. And they can generalize to new exemplars within a category. So it may be that the category, so one of the ways that people critique things is saying, well, you can't tell what a new member of a category is the first time. The GANs are actually quite good at building a model space for the whole category. So you can imagine that what your brain actually could have is a lot of different generative networks that enable understanding of each category. So it's not just that a category is a stacked up set of examples. It's also generative in some way just from something like a GANs architecture. Who knows? Um, OK. So this is, this is an example. There was this particular Google paper where they critiqued um, labeling of pictures because they got these um, really weird labels. So like the plain one, which is a famous picture of a plane tearing through a bridge, I forget, in Eastern Europe somewhere. An airplane is parked on the tarmac at an airport is the interpretation it came up with. OK. But the models being tested didn't have real world knowledge of context. They were only supposed to be models that captioned simple single objects or two objects interacting. So yes, of course, we need to ultimately build networks and AI systems that understand real world context, that have causality, that do reasoning. But to then hold them to the standard where we're bringing our whole brains to bear on and acting like they're dumb because of the fact that they mislabeled these things isn't really a deep insight. All it is is an insight saying, yeah, we need to do more work. But somehow these things get held up as these shining examples of why AI is failing, which I think is a mistake. Um, so I'm just going to finish up. Let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. So I did want to mention that. So if you're curious about this kind of stuff and you ever want to play with brain data, we have a data set called Bold 5000. You go to bold5000.org, you can download the whole data set. It's four human beings looking at 5,000 images in the MRI scanner. You can get their whole brain data. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot of data, 5,000 images times four people, but that took 20 hours per person to collect going into the scanner. Um, it's really painful. Scanning is slow. Getting human data or monkey data is really slow. but you can play with the data set. Um, it's fairly clearly specified what the data structure is. One of the interesting things is that the pictures were actually all pictures taken from computer vision data sets. So 2,000 of them are from COCO, Common Objects in Context. 2,000 of them are from ImageNet, probably the most famous data set. And 1,000 of them are from the Sun Scene Database. So you know, we've done all sorts of things. We've begun to play with them. This is the data we're using for regularization. We, um, we, you know, you can do TSNE on the data. Why isn't it? It's not showing my TSNE graphs. All right, I don't know where they went. Anyway, um, they were there. You can look at this. We can do things like separate the data by category, just Coco versus ImageNet versus Sun quite easily in TSNE. The data looks good. We've just started to play with it. Other labs. It's been downloaded like three thousand times. 
But if you want to play with a biological, not large-scale data set, but bigger-scale data set, it's at least something. There's other ones that are beginning to come out, but we're probably one of the biggest for human data. Again, human, collecting human data like that's hard and slow. Uh, is there anything else I want to say? I talked about that. Yeah, that was the research I already talked about. Okay, so I think I'll just tie it up there. Questions? Anything people want to know? Right. Maybe human has a small background because they start introducing things, you know, from their womb when they're babies. Your 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 neural network, they they just started with you know random random initialization. So I think maybe maybe it's fair to to provide your neural network like knowledge background. Oh, I think that's right. I think one of the things that people do is they underestimate how much data actually comes into the baby from birth onwards. And so the baby's visual world isn't that interesting when it's young, but it's still visual world. You know, a lot of faces, a lot of high contrast stuff, some bars or whatever it is. But it's getting visual input all the time. And there's no, it's hard to even characterize what number of samples you would really say a baby's getting. Well, how many labeled examples if it's awake for 18 hours a day or whatever it is. It's not, not that much, but 12 hours a day um, seeing stuff. Um, and I think the interesting thing that, from the neural network point of view, isn't that the baby isn't seeing things like a neural network. One is the baby is seeing a much more limited environment. Two, it's not really getting labels. So this weekly supervised paradigm is probably a better paradigm. But then three, you'd want your neural network to ultimately transition where it can begin to learn rapidly when it sees a singular example because it's had enough data. So the way you typically train a network now, like AlexNet or just you know, VGG or whatever, is you can just continue to give it labeled data. There's no, there's no um, transition to a different kind of learning. But what you really would like from what you're describing is a network that sort of begins to know what it knows, and then it adaptively begins to make stronger inferences about each of the inputs coming in because it's built that database. So few shot networks don't really work. Well, they kind of do. Some of them do. But they don't really have a continuous transformation. They typically have a training regimen, and then they go to the few shot regimen. So what you really want is something that's much more adaptive. It's almost like active learning. But I think you're right. It's just a matter of how we describe that process and then build better models of it. Other questions? So if you're interested in this stuff at all, um, my lab does a lot of vision stuff. I actually have all my graduate students right now are in computer science. There's, um, if you're interested in language, there's a new faculty member named Dan Yurofsky in our department that's doing um, a lot of high density observation of caregiver child interactions, looking at all the visual information, all of the verbal information, the prosody, and then doing a lot of modeling of that kind of data. There's other people in the psych department that are doing some things, but those are probably two of the best examples. If, if, if you want to get your hands on being more involved in this kind of connectivity things. Um, there, I mean, Bigshaw's got some interest. I think he's doing some work on environmental sounds and how people represent that information. They're in computer science. There's other faculty interested in, oh, well, notably in machine learning, Artie Singh and Leila Wahebi are doing work on this. Leila in particular collects a lot of human data. Um, and in robotics, Probably they're all real busy, <laughs> but there's a lot of people that have some interest in biological vision as well. Certainly Deva Ramanan does, Abhinav Gupta does, Marcel Haber does, but it is, if you haven't experienced it, they're all hard to get a hold of. But um, there are, I can sort of guide people to if you have some other interest in terms of trying to connect you with people. There are people interested, for instance, in like observing human affect and then doing automatic coding of human affect as people interact in different kinds of settings, things like that as well. All right. All good? Thank you. <laughs>